Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Poem City LGBTQ Reading, Special Eclipse Edition. <laughs> I'm Ann Charles, here to welcome you and uh, tell you a little bit about our program today. We have three poets, four poets, a fourth is arriving, we hope. Um, and they're gonna read for about 10 minutes. And then we'll have a little Q&A, and then we'll go forth into the evening and celebrate the eclipse or do whatever we choose. I'd like to thank Poem City and the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Uh, I think I told you my name, Ann Charles. I'm uh, gonna be your moderator today. And uh, let's go forward. Let's start with Kim Ward, who is a poet and playwright and a visual and theater artist. You may have seen Kim around town in various incarnations, theatrical, poetic, and otherwise. Uh, she's the founder of the Vermont Playwright Circle and received her MFA in performance poetry from Goddard College in 1998. Her play, Angel in the Fire, received the 1999 Playwright Showcase Award by the Vermont Actors and Theater Artists Association. It was also accepted into the New Frontiers Conference of 2000. She has lived in Montpelier for over 20 years and teaches English at Norwich University. Welcome, Kim. Thank you, a lovely introduction. So I have this book that's coming out very soon, but I also have copies of it tonight if anyone would like a copy. I'm gonna be that, I used to be that person who would say, oh, they're reading from their book, do they need to do that? And now I'm like, oh, I get it. <laughs> but this is where it all is, right? But I do have uh, something that I pulled out that's apropos of the eclipse as well. Oh, you know what? I gotta go get my glasses. I brought them. I love it. I can either see you or read the page. <laughs> Let's see. So it's interesting when I try to choose poems, deciding for this night, what are you gonna read? And I find there's some poems I read more in LGBTQ settings than other settings, so that's what I'm doing. Um, this is called Recovering Wife Speaks. Hurry, close the gap between betrothal and denial, between passion and understanding why my wings did not beat once in 30 years of living. Last night I dreamt a great turtle was running with me on its back. Proofreading the desert, it insisted we were on a mission. We met a woman with a wild red mane. She fed me sweet apples. Her lover, confusing women with eagles, had chased her out with a shotgun in the middle of the night. We proofread the desert together. The turtle gave up its shell for us, and we swam in its bowl of ocean. She was laughing water, and I was in the driver's seat my smile bordering on cool, until I saw her slender hand poised to touch the horrific past before me and awoke alone. I promised I'd, myself I'd put on a timer. I, was, I wrote that, was, uh, maybe you can tell, as I was getting divorced from my ex-husband, <laughs> who's not a bad guy. This is called The Vision. There was going to be a fire. I saw it. The bookcase was a flame burning through the dark, words spitting outward like stars. When I got home, it was over. The kitchen window gaped blackly. It made me shiver to think how close I'd been to death. While picking through bedroom ashes, the night came back to me. We'd tried to rub loneliness from our bodies. Your drunkenness was full of new shyness. My fear of entanglement, a raw river that parted the flames between us until I became a lone flame whispering, became a dark warmth. 
a space at the center of your eye, a wing in the sternum of a woman, a word I could not hear, and the word fit itself inside the cry of an owl that beat its wings against me until you spoke, your tongue sending forth rivers of truth that finally did not burn the darkness, but scattered it like stars. That poem was written as I was coming out as a bi woman and a friend of mine was coming out and transitioning. That's kind of the backstory of that. Ooh, someone's in trouble. So it's screaming out there. Ooh, this is called The Way We See the World. The way we see the world crumbles into new country the moment we dance outside of the circle. The way you move entices me out, leaves me dreaming we are lovers. Do you know the desert inside of me? See yourself become the great breath let out upon the sand, the large crack running through the belly of my world. I put my hand to your cheek, which dissolves into Black Knight's brow, into lightning traveling a warrior skin, queen's skin. New skies open up in my ribs until I cannot breathe. You are the beating wing of tenderness, country of origin unknown, beauty unmistakable. That was a poem I wrote for my now ex-partner who I was with almost 18 years. We're still close. That was when we first started dating. But then she also suffers from a lot of depression. So I have a few poems in here <clears throat> that deal with depression. And this is called Go Still. Autumn air seeps into your summer house. You go still inside and feel the swirl of stars buoy you. You go still and deep and let the incision be the path. Let the slow, solid pump of that muscle, the deep heart, carry you through. What courses in my veins is poison in eternal life. It's gamma ray and goddess shine. I forget that among the tumult of the day until Autumn air seeps into my summer house, and I go still and feel the swirl of stars buoy me. So there's a section, there's three sections in this book. The first one is love poems, poems dealing with just personal relationships. The second one is a group of poems that I wrote after several years of studying the runes. And it attempts to use what the Nordic um, Etic verse format was. And that's where the title Fire in a Circle comes from. So I thought, why not read the, the title poem, the poem that sort of created that title? Um, these are very short, single, line, single stanza poems. And the word I'm going to use, which is the title, is Rido, R-A-I-D-O. And it means um, journey, and in particular, journey on horseback or journey to self. Rido, wheel of days, crushes a month of thunder beneath its heel. The journey is pleasure, while the world is a flame I follow. I dip myself in the water of the rains, live off of the land. And the land I travel is strange. Give me the hand you want held out, Rido. Let my horse slow only when it is at the end of our trail, so that I may know when to stop. The pursuit is fire on a circle, water anointing my bare head, and the clear aster of a new moon sky blazing blackly above. It's the only rune poem I'll torture you with. Those have been kind of fun to write because I'm trying to understand these ancient runes that people carved into trees and rocks. They had totally different cultural mindsets, but just trying to bring them into the modern day for myself. Um, this poem is actually a tiny bit from my play, Angel in the Fire, that was mentioned. It's called Harvest Time. It's very short, so I'm going to wait till it's very short. Red moon this morning, I am walking barefoot in puddles and find the hogs have been killed uphill. That's spoken by a character that represents my grandmother. She grew up on a 250-acre farm in Richmond, which when it flooded, everybody in town came to their farm. And she was like, you know, helping do everything at eight years old. So. 
And this is a short one called Fever that's also from Angel in the Fire. When you caught the fever, it wasn't the doctor who told your mother what to do. It was the whiskey and water to break the fever, the burning of the body brought down by liquid fire. We brought you through like a horse, brought through a burning barn, while down in the yard, drifting up to us through the cold frost, came the sound of your grandfather praying. And again, so it's this play I wrote is about three generations of women uh, living in Vermont. And my grandmother, my mother used to say that her grandmother said, what you need when you're sick is whiskey and red liniment. And I'm like, what the heck is red lin liniment? And she said, we have no idea. Who knows, who knows what, what were people giving them? But that's what she would do. It, the whiskey obviously broke the fever. <laughs> Uh, this poem comes from, there's a quote that I love from Andrea Long Chu's book called Females, which talks about gender and the female situation of, you know, feminism. And the quote she had is, and the combination of Eve plus testosterone would produce Adam in her world, right? Formula, fire, vessel, strap. In what way did I truly first come to pass? Eclipse, skip, turn, my skin truly burns, to be let loose on the cobblestones of the city. And if I had been thicker, taller, less pretty, had the formula have raged over a Bunsen a bit longer, then would I have surely been the king of my own destiny, the queen left behind in the mud pit. In the tin plus estrogen minus father equals trailer of my childhood home to rot. And so last but not least, I did dig out a different piece that comes from that. I was studying um, haiku and renga poetry a lot when I was in my master's program. And renga were these poems that you would always have to include the moon and flowers in. And they're very similar. They're precursors to haiku. But this is a little longer than a haiku. The moon blocks out the sun today. For a brief moment, night at noon. I am eight. The cement steps have a hole beneath them. Bees dip and fly silently between my legs, waiting for me to move. Until you come and pick me up in the dark, and we watch the moon do -si do with the sun. Visions of old apocalyptic stories fresh on our minds. Then the sound of the bull in the field across the way startles me and you take me inside. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I forgot to tell you that there are books on sale in the rear. So after the reading, you might want to uh, ask the poets to sign them and purchase a copy. Um, our next reader is Linda Quinlan, whose book, Chelsea Creek, was published by Brickhouse Press and was the recipient of the Wicked Women's Poetry Award. And I think Linda is a wicked woman. That's my <laughs> personal perspective. Her poetry has appeared in many literary journals, some of which include Sinister Wisdom and the New Orleans Literary Review. She was Poet of the Year in Wisconsin and is working on a manuscript for another book. Welcome, Linda. Yes. <sighs> well, um, I'm going to start out with a fairly new poem that I've been working on. And um, it's not my proudest moment, but it was a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and it's called Secrets. <clears throat> I've kept your secret 40 years. I carried a bag of money to a woman patient of yours that was blackmailing you. The day was snowy. I couldn't find my boots in the back of the closet where so much is buried and forgotten. The white coat you discarded at her apartment smelled antiseptic. 
With a small dot of blood on the collar, you would have never noticed. I hand over a paper bag filled with money, working class lesbian swagger. I warn the woman to never ask again. Leave word with your receptionist that your house is cleaned, and yes, I lock the door. I blink, and here we are, retired and sipping tea on the patio before your husband comes home. We've had some interesting times, haven't we? And click our teacups and smile. The gazebo is still overgrown with ivy that tangles together, holding up the old furnished wood with splinters as big as our lives. So like I said, not my finest moment, but. Um, and um, this is, um, a not, not another not finest <laughs> moment, <laughs> but, um, and it's about my cousin, and it's called Babysitting Danny. Danny and I met for the last time at a Fifth Street bar, two doors down from his mother's old haunt, where I ran numbers for her to the boogie joint across the street. My hand reaches for him, then retreats. He is a tear waiting to fall on my cheek. I taught him to steal at Woolworth's. He emptied his small pockets and delivered his haul to older girls he wanted to please. Balloons, eyeliner, and candy lips that bled into our mouths. His mother was 43 when she was found dead, empty pill bottles beside her, no last words, in an apartment above Cat's Bagels. I wanted to steal something for him to give him his mother's laugh, the way she held a martini and a cigarette. I paid for his beer and offered nothing more. He lagged behind me, my car door opened and shut. Six months later, he's dead. Beer bottles on the floor, California sun on my face when I get the call. A gun in his hand, no suicide note. A lone picture of his mother on the nightstand. So, um, and, Um, this is your finest moment. <laughs> huh? Your finest moment. Your finest moment. No, this is no. well. <laughs> I've had a lot of finest moments, but, <laughs> which I'll read more of later. But um, this is called Bloodsuckers. I'm bored. Vis you, you ever go with your parents to like your relatives on Sunday afternoons, and you wanted to just like pull your hair out? <laughs> This is about that. Anyway, I'm bored visiting aunts. My parents sent me off to a pond down the road. Water lilies play with me, a comfort, the way friends are when you're 11 and nothing else matters. The bottom is murky. I try to stay afloat and I feel older as I look at a boulder, half submerged, the way adults seem when they're lying to you. The thing is, when you're young, when you're young, murmurs from the kitchen sink into you. Carol is pregnant. The boy is a jerk. The mental hospital killed your grandfather. When I touch the boulder, my wet hands on my face, it seems to be sobbing, but it's just me kicking my feet to stay afloat. My parents call me from the car, and I move slowly to be annoying, I'm sure. There are black spots on my skin. My father notices them the same time I do, and he yells to my mother, go get the tweezers. They are between her toes. At home, my mother's on the phone the way she is when I had scarlet fever, and they quarantined the house, my hallucinations of dying ducks, and giant people telling me I'd be okay while playing, praying on their knees beside my bed. So. And of the new poems, 
I will read um, Father Tom. And I could say that, again, this is not my favorite, you know, my, my finest hour. Um, I don't know, I had a rough childhood. Um, but anyway, Father Tom, a priest at St. Rose. 45 years after Faze's suicide, Tommy finds me on Facebook. His sister perched behind his familiar eyes, a distant cooing of someone long gone. He was 12 and I 14 when I taught him to French kiss. I had totally forgotten what he remembered as divine. <clears throat> he asked for pictures of his sister, and I had many. Tease brown hair, black nylons, and a look of toughness we all flaunted. In one, she's standing beside, uh, in, I'm sorry, we all flaunted. In one, she's standing beside Diane, who carries a switchblade in her pocket. We didn't talk about the mental hospital or how we scammed to break her out, give her back her daughter stolen from her arms, and move to New York City. Her daughter is 55 now, brought up in some suburb. I hope she is loved, has a fuck you swagger, and devours Italian food. <laughs> Neither of us cries until one day I'm in the car and the old station plays Tommy, can you hear me? I was a pinball wizard at Revere Beach. Faze cheered me on and insisted we hang by the Himalaya, rising our voices towards the waves. Before the time that nothing would bring her joy. Sorry, I went to the wrong page. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody here from Boston or around Boston or no? Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so this one is called Chelsea Mass. And actually, the poem I read about Danny was her son. This was my aunt. And um, so it's called Chelsea Mass. Then as her February birth, my Aunt Evie swayed with every half tone, the spontaneous steps of a child living outside Newfoundland, the fishing village of her family's past. This wasn't New Orleans, where she might have had a chance where anger and creativity collide. This was Chelsea, a city of bad daughters and warlike sons where nothing grew but immigrants and hunger. Her father's madness beckoned him to an ocean death, but instead he crawled into dementia, soaked in beer and sadness, the smell of urine even when he slept. My aunt married one summer, a man back from the war in Europe, his pale violence swelling out of every room made him a ghost. She danced at home over the kitchen tile that curled in the corners. She danced in circles while her daughter slept, until her husband took their child away, punishing her dance, commanded a beat from the suburbs, and snapped his fingers again and again and again, until even her suicide seemed clumsy. Okay, let's see. A little on the lighter side. <laughs> Um, which is, you know, hard, but. Um, so this one is called Regrets. I know it doesn't sound it, but it, it really is. My father, my, fa my favorite coffee stained cup teeters on the dish rack where a precarious balance of glasses faces the blinds that refuse to shut and all the women I've disappointed gather on the front porch swing dangling rebukes. And every day while walking to work on Canal Street, I want to pay the half-blind gospel preacher to stop. 
A friend gave me a ceiling fan that stopped spinning, and Barbara knew I lied. After we hitched to Montreal, her hands stayed closer to her sides on those long night walks we took, where motorcycles roared outside the frenzy of getting somewhere in a chrome, shiny life that left no apologies. My half-unpacked suitcase leans against the salvage antique rocker, too delicate for sitting, and I remember fly fishing with my father, avoiding all obstacles. We cast a wider and wider circle over the grass in the backyard. And, and this last poem, um, I guess it's, um, well, it, it's about Montpelier, and I, I just have to read it when I'm in Montpelier. I don't know, it's a little sarcastic. Um, so, <laughs> um, hang in there. <laughs> Montpelier, Vermont. The party was crowded with women, all white and all middle-aged, and still I felt out of place. No Merrill boots tucked neatly by the door. And the wood stove had a pumpkin kind of face that threw heat, but not nearly enough. A woman sighs and stretches her purple wool socks slouched down around her ankles. Says, this is the best place in the world to live. The village is full of smug, contented people with nowhere to go after nine o'clock. I wonder where she's been to believe this, but I don't ask. Certainly not to Barcelona or Mexico where the buzz twinkles in midnight melodies of bodies, and if you fall into it in a ditch in the dark, it's your own damn fault. <laughs> yes, there is good health care here and progressives and endless winters. So I leave the village often, carry with me the conflicted beauty of mountains that smother and soothe breasts of contentment. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Now our next reader um, is a local luminary also, and I hate to mention it, but I know it's a poetic setting, but if you have uh, political in inclinations and live in Barrie, uh, you may see Sam Stockwell's name on the ballot for mayor. Just a shameless plug, <laughs> unrelated to poetry maybe. Sam Stockwell has published in Agni, North American Review, and The New Yorker, among other publications. Her new book, in the back, I presume. Musical Figures is published by 30 West Publishing House. Her two previous books, Theater of Animals and Recital, won the National Poetry Series and the Editor's Prize at Elixir, respectively. She won the Massachusetts Poetry Festival First Poem Prize was selected as the Editor's Choice at Panoply and was the Editor's Choice for Brian Mill Press. Sam, welcome. Thank you. I'll start with a couple poems. I will start with by making sure I know what time it is. <laughs> Can you put the microphone down a little? Uh, thank you. I need to do this. <laughs> first period. Brave Mrs. Kenley turns her back on the first grade, and like a grass fire from raw blade to raw blade, enmity spreads. Mr. Hawkins twists paper clips around his knuckles. Mrs. Thompson and Mrs. Hall sit at their stern desks, squinting at long absent children, shuddering at the mirage of Theodore, his head clean and empty as a silver pond. No cultivated seed grew in his acre, no stray fact lodged between his teeth. 
The void must be extracted. That was the clock for Theodore. Mrs. Thompson remembers him without even the fondness one feels for a good meal. City bus. I was, I was a somewhat sickly child, and so I, I had pneumonia for like a long, long time and spent a long time in the hospital. City bus. My fever hovered over long evenings in the hospital, and the nurse said, you're going to be here forever. In clean linen sheets, but gasping, with my books beside me, but silenced, unlike the boy in the next bed over whose brain was erupting, who cried when they moved him. Released and returned to school, I got on the wrong bus the lip of the door sealing and the lurch forward afraid the right bus would never come. Furious rounds I traveled to streets I didn't know, clasped in my waiting. My father served in World War II, and that was um, an experience that really he continued living in throughout the rest of his life. Dining out. When my father climbs out of the restaurant, he's 10 years older. His hands mottle in the sun when he resurfaces. Scared, he returns for a drink. He dives back to his table, and his war buddies are there. When he leaves, the sidewalk is being bombed. He falls to the ground, tastes cement dust. He rejoins his buddies laughing. The war drops him behind enemy lines, his outstretched hand reaching towards us. Forty or fifty years pass. He can't remember. He leaves the restaurant an old man, trying to cross the street to his front porch, lilacs in bloom and ivy climbing the chimney. My parents married each other several times. Of course, to do that, they had to divorce. They divorced several times. <laughs> Categories. My father's sputtering conversation clapped in time to ice knocking in his drink. Look at that, my mother says, to atrocity and the price of bacon, ca catastrophes of equal measure. She paints fairies on teacups and walks the street handing out dollar bills. My mother sorts her collection of sugar packets and plastic bags. All the kids have sided with their father. The police, the pastor, none rescue her despite her frequent calls. His physical therapist, the receptionist, none save him, though my mother thinks each his secret lover. And the social workers bumping against each other on the narrow couch have neither love nor cure. She moves to the microwave. The meals she made, the loads of laundry. She cuts one leg off his dress pants. She mails each child an empty box. Don't you believe people can do anything if they try? Asked my sister. I shook my head. My parents were an argument emptied of everything but motion. My father sawed her paintings in half. She threw his medication into the snow, the green and blue traces like lively worms. After we divided them, after my mother's stroke, I would hang jewelry on her when my father came to visit. My father, marooned in the place he wanted, cries over the phone, I miss her so much. He sends her a letter. You don't have any friends now, do you? And I think one more poem from this. Road Trip. We slept by the highway in West Virginia. I don't remember how we made it that far. By morning, the gullies of the sleeping bag were filled with snow. In the few houses strewn beneath the overpass, we could smell cornbread fry frying and hear dogs. Because his parents were wealthy, he was supposed to bring money. He unrolled a candy bar and a quarter, his broad shoulders shaking as he wept. We turned back a long way from New Jersey. I knew somebody in the splatter of houses would take us in, 
and I would have my hand on him to show he was meek, and slowly nod to show I was wise. And now I will fumble with some of the poems in here. (laughs) Sprite. And Sprite in this case refers to the soda, not the fairy. My wife, I I, uh, have insomnia a lot, and um, so sleep is a treasured and rare visitor. My wife untangled me from a spurt of sleep, and in the dark, cold snow crust, we skippered over to our neighbor. His top half collapsed over his lower, braced in the snow by one fist. The wheelchair hunched over his back, his head inching to the snow, his head inching to the snow at the end of the ramp, his voice softer than dark, but but J.R. deaf had heard him as she limped along the road with the urgent need of the dog at the coldest hour. And now the two old of us maneuvered him back in his chair and back into his house. We crunched crunched on empty soda cans by the ramp. And we also have empty cans and pets to be rich with. And where was his lonely mother who talks with her chihuahua as if he were reason and and temperance? My family came from deepest, darkest, central Maine. Um, so everything south of everything south of Maine was the south. Mm-hmm. And they, they didn't go out a lot. Apple cake. The afternoon clouds came out in the afternoon sky. My uncle is taking us for a long ride. The ride goes by a paper mill where he worked in a long nothing of closed stores and stubs of forest like the memory of youth, only partially furnished and visited on occasion. He wasn't looking anyway. He was caught in the now of his odd nieces and their stray comments. They would have cake with his wife later and return to the South, which as often as he had visited, he had no language for. Um, When I was in college, often, um, well, not often, but occasionally some people would just break down because college is stressful and it's, um, and there you are. You're away from your home and family and you're in a completely different environment. And this was Goddard, so it was a really completely, completely different environment. She was blonde. She said she needed to scream, so I walked with her on the lawn of the campus. You know how you see a mistaken assumption stroking its broken heart? The ambulance arrived for her dizzy head, one shrieking, one screaming. I could never scream. It wouldn't come back out. Broke like that, yawning and numb. I was a poor handmaiden to madness, familiar but not encouraging. You remember how Canal Street feels like the backstage for an idea of a city? Forbidden, only the creators wander here, not the creations and spandex and jokes stuttering under streetlights. This is about some, well, it's called the Mechanics Dining at Backstreet Grill, and it's about mechanics dining at Backstreet Grill. (laughs) So it's in the voice of one of the mechanics. Yes, I guess I could measure my wealth in the times when I haven't been bored. My body leaning as if I was confused laundry on a windy day, bellows inside and out my poor buffeted brain, but awake rejoined, if I had wealth, this would have to be it. Daniel said we were flung high but was interrupted, a burp abruptly by an outsider, and not so bright, more like the dim in a broom closet. It made me feel better about my failures. I murmured odily to Alex 
and I chewed on a cigar with my bourbon as though I was mighty. I'm not complaining, although I wanted, before I was my mother's, a hand on my brow signifying greatness, an emollient bestowing a secret mark, and ever after, a cake without compare. I'll read a couple more. Like Kim, I teach English. At, I teach at Community College of Vermont. And this is the Sermon on Composition. A sentence, Michelle, is an equation. It needs two balanced parts, tired sentences and fresh sentences both. It won't make you old to know this. You have learned harder things. If it is Emerson you have to blame for the state of modern poetry, then surely it is Thomas Aquinas you must blame for your essays. All human passion undulates in a form, like geese tethered in an arrow. You keep your eye on the horizon. Whatever has fallen will rise up. Whatever has risen will have its low moment. Fame and grief follow the same path, even in the complex fortunes of a young woman. And one more. Getting there soon. <laughs> My father made a still next to our air raid shelter. The men passed the jug around, choking and weeping, their faces blistering, saying, this is good. Then the rare great aunts arrived in identical floral bosoms. Each mashed my face in her cleavage and fluffed my hair with embroidered handkerchiefs. The men wiped their bright lips on their arms in girlish embarrassment, jostling the cigarette packs rolled in the sleeves of their t-shirts. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Now, we have a fourth reader who hasn't appeared yet. He's making his way from the Northeast Kingdom here on Eclipse Day. But he may not make it. <laughs> but in the interim, I thought maybe we would take some time and chat with the poets in the form of a Q&A. And I have a question I'd like to start off with, my favorite question that poets don't often, sometimes don't like to answer, but I'll just pose it anyway. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> good. I'm always interested in literary influences. So would you mind talking about your literary influences? And I think this detaches, and we can come to you if you. Look at that. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm used to this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a kid, it was, of course, Emily Jenkinson, right? And as a young adult in, um, in my 20s, it was like Sylvia Plath and uh, Anne Sexton and, uh, you know, the whole group there. And, um, and then as later, uh, when I came out, and it was Audre Lorde, and um, uh, Adrian Rich. <laughs> it was Adrian Rich, and um, a lot of lesbian poets. Um, uh, and so, the, you know, those were my main influences. Um, I, I also really like Eileen Miles. Um, I, I sort of feel like. Um, She's a working class poet, and I sort of am a working class poet, and or at least you know I was, um, and so 
she's her style and her um, sort of attitude. I really like a lot. So uh, anyway, there you go. I think the first poet that I chose to read when I was a teenager was Denise Leverton. And I was just like, oh, a living woman poet. It just seemed great. But I'm, <laughs> so I loved her work because she was alive. And it was, you know, my first choice. But when I got to college, I was introduced to a number of poets. And I really liked, and, and I went directly from undergraduate school to graduate school in, po in creative writing. So I was really immersed in all the poets of that time. So I probably read Robert Haas, his first book, Until It Fell Apart, certainly Louise Glick and Ellen Void because they were my teachers. And then I found John Berryman and the world like opened up for me. I mean, I didn't read any of my more abstract work, but um, his, his voice is so powerful. Oh, and the gay poet in Boston, who wrote In the Western Night. Mm. That's an excellent book. And I remember reading that, like I read it from cover to cover, and then I read it again from cover to cover. I also like Gloria Sheck a lot. I think I read her when I was, you know, in my 40s. And I was really impressed with some of the things that she does with language. Yes. Well, should we tie up, Linda? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there are so many people. I would I ditto know. almost everybody you said, definitely. Um, um, also, some of the folks that you said I read. When I got to college, I discovered some really fun people, including Anne Sexton, um, Octavio Paz. I became obsessed with Octavio Paz and all of the Latin American poets, because, of course, I took a Latin American seminar. But um, I took this course in the 80s at Johnson State called The Black Experience, which was one of those rare times when they really did talk about racism in the country. And I discovered Ntozaka Shange is for colored girls who have considered purple when this, with suicide when the rainbow is enough. And because she was doing poetry on stage, that was what really hooked me. Because I am a theater <coughs> baby at heart, but I also love poetry. And Maris Wolf, who teaches, I think still there, um, was doing dance to poetry. Emily Dickinson, I got to go to her house last year. It had just been refurbished, and I stood in the entryway. And I turned around, because they said, this door was not on, you know, when they died, when the last, when she died, and there was no one in the house anymore. The house did, you know, someone rented it or something. They took the front door off, and but the the curator said we were really lucky that they saved the door for some reason, and we recently put it back. So I turned around and I like touched the handle, and I was like Emily Dickinson. Touched the <laughs> <laughs> just like, you know, I just thought it was the coolest thing. But yeah, those are some of my influences. And they just recently um, refurbished uh, her brother's house across the We valley. tried to go and it was closed. It's, but it's, it's just barely been finished, so maybe this summer. Maybe. Other questions or comments? Oh, we have a shy audience. I have a question. Thank you. Sure. So, um, okay. What is it like, you know, writing these songs in private, I'm assuming, I mean, private when you write them, and then now you're sharing them in public, here, you share them in your books. Compare that experience, if you wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. Two. The difference in life. Oh, that's me. Sorry. Yay, we knew what you meant. You know, yeah. Private and public. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Writing it in private and then presenting it in public and publishing Just it. Just what the experience is. I know. Well, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about that because I, I'm never private. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'm like that too. Yeah, see? You know, um, but, you know, in, this, in, the, in the moments that I am, uh, you know, it's like in the elevator going to my apartment or, you know, sitting outside, um, you know, these... It will come to me, you know, like what I'm, what I'm thinking about. Um, and it really, you know, I'm one of those people that it's, it's really, I, maybe everybody is, I don't know, but to sit down and actually think, okay, now I'm going to write. Mm -hmm. um, 
now I have something that I want to work on. <clears throat> and that's, you know, partly because I'm never private, I'm so social. I'm like, who's meeting me for coffee today? Where are we going to have dinner? <laughs> you know. But anyway, um, to answer your question, you know, the solitude of it, I really like, and it's also really, really hard, I think. So that's my answer. Sticking to it. Thanks. <coughs> I think for me, I, I would absolutely echo, like I'm such an extrovert, that, and I used to write three lines and go, look, mom. <laughs> and I go to a reading, brand new poem. I just wrote this, it might be crap, and then I would read it. Um, and some poets are not like that, I, I know that from just knowing from it. But um, I think the bigger difference for me was writing versus writing once I came out. That was the big difference. Because I remember writing some poem in college, and I was not out at all. And um, I showed it to my advisor, and he said, why all this subterfuge? Why just not say this is a lesbian relationship? You know, I was like, <laughs> ran away, terrified. <laughs> so, and so a lot, like, when I come to something like this, that's why I'm like, what do I read? I have that one, this one poem I wrote about safer sex during the AIDS epidemic. It's probably the most, you know, lesbian, you know, poem I've ever written. And so it's, it's that difference. But, but sitting down alone to write, Sometimes, I mean, I have just recorded something in the car because our new car has a mic, like a memo, and I'm like, oh crap, and you know, like, you gotta, you gotta get it down. I mean, you must have that experience, like, there's a lyric, I've gotta write it down. So it just kind of comes out of you. And then it's like, well, someone's gonna listen to it, I hope, right? <laughs> That's why I write. Yeah. I'm very introverted, so. <laughs> You're what I'm writing in my closet, that's much better. Um, <laughs> Being a, reading it in public is, is hard. It, it's a bit of a challenge. And, you know, I'm such a big fan of John Berryman. So he's on YouTube. So you can get these old YouTubes of John Berryman reading his poetry. Well, he read it completely wrong. <laughs> so like, hearing him read it, I was like, you put the emphasis there? Are you sure, dude? Because I know that poem by heart. <laughs> so for me, the poems I, that I love are poems that I know from paper. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, and someone else said this, but once a poem's on paper, it's your experience. You know, mm -hmm. you, it's it's not the thing that that someone has produced. It's what you've made of it. So um, it is really different. I, I, sometimes I've gotten great responses or terrible responses to my poems reading them, and I I think it is all the performance and not necessarily, which is different from music. But, right. Yeah. I think it takes great bravery to get up and read a poem. I just have to say that because as someone who like, I'm a musician. I play guitar and sing. Like, to get up there and just speak your innermost thoughts without anything, and people don't even clap after each poem. I mean, I don't know how you guys do it. No, we do. We, is this just me, or do you live that moment when you finish a poem or you say a line in the poem, the whole audience goes, mmm. Yes, yes, yes. You get that. <laughs> <laughs> like you ended a poem tonight, and I went. Oh. Right. <laughs> that's it. That's what we look for. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different type of applause. It is. Yeah. I like that. Well, you know, it was really hard. Like I did some poetry readings on Zoom, where everyone was muted, and so you, and like hearing people's attention, which you really hear through their breathing, it was like reading to a to a wall. So that's, yeah. that was much harder. Yeah. yeah. So you can empathize with that time and then, like the height of the pandemic. Playing like, on Zoom. He did like, Zoom concerts. It was like, so like, yeah. I like people are really like in the group chat. They love it. Yeah, yeah, you have to see I the chat. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. So where do you all, where do you play music? All oh, around town? Oh, yeah. Stage well, it's not on me until you get it. Yeah, well, still. Stage college. <laughs> so, Sam, Sam was my gonna, daughter's mentor yes. for poetry, oh, so I'm thank you. My daughter, Hava, who just is graduating with a degree in poetry from Bard. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. She went to Bard? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's yeah. graduating in May. She went where? Bard College. Oh, Bard. I think it takes a lot of bravery to write a poem. When I think of some of the stuff you're talking about, it's very. Yeah. Um, and I love um, what Kim, you know, what Kim said about coming out because I read a collection from a friend who hadn't come out, and she changed the pronouns. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. Um, 
But other questions or comments? I think there are a lot of artists in the room. Who might I have, have a strange one. <laughs> sure. So I'm a historian. I translate old French journals from the French and Indian War. That's what I do. But every now and then, I wake up in the morning, and there's a completed poem in my mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have to go and write it down. And it is absolutely complete, and I didn't know I was writing it. Uh, so does that happen to you guys at all? It has. Uh, at least one of the poems I read, the one about the, um, I met a woman with a wild red mane, and we wrote yeah. on a turtle. That was a dream. Yeah, the, the two I read at the opening were, I just woke up one morning, and they were completely done, and I didn't know I was doing them. And I just wondered if that happens a lot. Sometimes. It happens sometimes, like when I did um, Montpelier, Vermont. Well, that's a that's good That's just like, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and it just came out. It, it was, was like, I, yeah, you know, I was like, okay. And, and so that was one that just was kind of, kind of wrote itself. Some are excruciating. <laughs> you know, trying to find the right word, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to yeah. find the right phrase. Um, you know, and, and the subject matter might be really difficult also. Mm -hmm. so. I have a question for you two. Well, speaking of that, um, you know, Sam uh, Colber, who runs Rootstock uh, Publishers, I told her, I was amazed in putting this book together. I've been performing this poem that I literally wrote in the car in my head. I know, it's one of the only poems I know by heart. I have been performing it for 10 years. I went to put it in this book and I went, oh, that needs to be wild men, not men. Like that one word. Do you feel like that's part of the process too for you guys? Like, yeah. like there's always a little something to tweak, and never quite done. Well, and sometimes in reading something, sometimes when you're reading something aloud, you, oh, you hear the mistake. Yeah. Like you hear, ah, oh, that doesn't work. That rhythm doesn't work. Or, or that word doesn't really work. Yeah. I can sweat it. Yeah. Yeah. Falls really flat. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but there are poems that come easily, quickly. They pretty much come out whole, like your experience, but not that doesn't help them all that much. And there are poems that are like years of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have a, a. I'm in a writing group with Sam actually, and um, we meet what once every five weeks. Well, theoretically once, once. Theoretically once a week. Yeah. Um, and I find that really helpful. Um, you know, I get a lot of good feedback and um, a lot of uh, uh, people who are, you know, good writers who can say, uh oh, well, that doesn't really work, or maybe you could try this or that. And so I find that really helpful. <laughs> How do you get introvert and you're running for mayor of Barry? I don't understand that part. I'm curious about that. <laughs> well, it's a. <laughs> Give my back to the introvert. She's an activist introvert. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a practice. You know, it's like people everywhere need someone who's going to just say, you know, things would be better for regular folks, for middle class folks, for poor people, for homeless people. And so, yeah, running is really hard. It's, I, I hate doing it, but I make a plan, I treat it as a game, I have people help me, and I just set it up. It, it took me, also, it helped, reading and writing poetry really helped me run for office, because there's this process of like making your statement right, mm -hmm. figuring out who you're gonna reach to, making sure you're out there, mm -hmm. you know, things that, of course, loathe, but <laughs> force myself to do. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's That's Similar to what you said when I interviewed you for the bridge. Yeah. I asked Sam what her poetry, I don't need a bike group. I asked Sam what her poetry and politics have in common. <laughs> and that similar answer came out. Similar answer, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You talked a lot about housing. Yeah. <laughs> well, picking up on what Linda was saying about her writing group, when I was talking to Kim, Earlier, we were talking about what a great place Central Vermont is for poetry. How alive not only Poem City, but you know all the poetry groups and all the readings this month. I mean, it's really fabulous and supportive. So you know, even though Linda has that Montpelier Vermont poem, I think we should. <laughs> <laughs>
We should give ourselves a round of applause. Buy some books, go forth into the evening, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.